Good afternoon, Facebook friends and family, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Chris Lambert. I'm the founder and CEO of Life Remodeled. For those of you who are not familiar with Life Remodeled, we exist to bridge people across divides, to help transform each other's lives. And the way we do that is by revitalizing neighborhoods in Detroit. Today, I ask that you please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest. I will introduce first off Pastor Chris Brooks, who has been a personal friend of mine for the last 10 years. And I'm proud to say he serves as a Life Remodel board member. Chris is the senior pastor of Woodside Bible Church, which meets in 14 different locations in our region, by the way, including a campus right here in the city of Detroit. Woodside Church has played a very large role in supporting Life Remodel, both financially and with thousands of volunteers. Chris also hosts a radio show on Moody Radio. Welcome to our show, Pastor Chris Brooks. Hey, Chris, thanks for having hey. me. All right, Reverend Larry Simmons. Reverend Larry and I have had the pleasure of knowing each other for, uh, well, ever since 2014. And we also have a very close group of friends that meet together virtually these days, every single week. Reverend Larry is the pastor of Babel Memorial AME Church in Detroit and executive director of the Brightmore Alliance. Uh, Simmons has led far more initiatives in the city of Detroit than I have time to mention, but I want to thank you, Reverend Larry, for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> That's certainly, but not least, Pastor Scott McKee is another man I've had the privilege of developing a solid relationship with over the last decade. Scott is the senior pastor of Ward Church, and their services are held in Northville, Michigan. Ward has donated more financial support to our mission than any other church, and many of our most committed volunteer leaders call Ward their home church. Some people don't know this about Scott, but Scott has also done a few professional comedy acts from time to time, and this guy is hilarious. So welcome, Pastor Yes, Scott. he is. Well, thank you, but looks aren't everything. Thank you. There you go. See, that's a free one. That's a free one, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so we're going to jump right in, and we want to hear your thoughts on COVID-19 from a pastor's perspective. So first of all, I hope the answer is no to this question, but has anyone in your congregation been diagnosed with COVID-19 or lost a loved one? And anyone can jump in on this one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's been uh, probably uh, the greatest season of uh, challenge and grief across our campuses than, than uh, what we've uh, faced. Uh, uh, and, and I've uh, uh, personally experienced the loss of close friends and uh, family that have been diagnosed, uh, praying right now for a cousin who's a nurse, who's uh, dealing with it as well. So yeah, definitely. Hmm. Reverend Larry, I'm gonna throw it over to you. We've been blessed. We have not had anybody in the church family who has been diagnosed. We have had one case in the neighborhood in the larger church that I'm aware of. I'm sure we've had others, uh, but praise God, he has recovered um, a really important leader in our community. Um, but it is inevitable that we will. We don't have a large church, but that really doesn't matter all of us are going to experience this passage closely. Agreed. Uh, Pastor Scott. Yeah, we've had a few confirmed cases and uh, one, one death. And mm. I, I expect those numbers to go up as we all do. Um, for us, I think what we're dealing with in all of our churches, aside from the physical concern, is the fear and anxiety that has taken root at different levels. Yes, yes. And yes. thankfully that's something the, the Bible addresses quite specifically. Uh, the, the medical part will leave to the medical professionals, but the Bible speaks very directly to, to fear and anxiety. This is a good opportunity for the church to speak. Yes. Yeah, I, you, I know, agree. You, gonna, you know, Scott, I was, I was just going to say, in addition to the fear and anxiety piece, the other part that's been uniquely difficult about this, uh, guys, uh, for us is the isolation causes people not to be able to grieve like they yes. should like they normally would, uh, those that yeah. they love. We have so many uh, people who can't be near to loved ones who are either in the hospital or even those who have lost loved ones They can't even have proper burials and um, time for mourning and grief. And that kind of multiplies the heaviness and the weight of this moment. It's one thing for 
a graduation or a commencement to be canceled, there's disappointment with that. But when you have a loved one that transitions and you can't have the type of uh, funeral services home going that you want, uh, yeah, that, that really is heavy for the person and for the shepherds, the pastors who love them. Yes. We're actually going to get into that specifically in a little bit. And I would encourage anyone who has questions to go ahead and type them in here on Facebook. But uh, I know all of us on this call agree that Jesus talked a whole lot about our calling to serve the marginalized and the suffering. And we also yeah. know that Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. So my yes. question to each of you, and, and we'll start with Reverend Larry, is who is Jesus calling us to focus most of our attention on right now in our region? And how is your church serving their needs? Well, as you know, our church is located in Brightmoor, uh, which as a, a community, uh, zip codes, uh, it is one of the most challenged in the country. Uh, highest rates of infant mortality, uh, low weight births, um, I think we have the highest number of water shutoffs. Uh, it's a very cha economically challenged community, uh, particularly with the COVID, what is now becoming known, but we have, those of us who are serving in the uh, communities of color had already begun to suspect anecdotally is that it's disproportionately affecting people of color, which given the uh, nature of the attack, uh, on those with pre-existing conditions, those who have um, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, uh, overweight. These are problems which we had before Corona came. So it was not unexpected that it would disproportionately hit us. But then you add the socioeconomic issues of the lack of water, because what's our principal weapon against this disease is to stay washed up. Can't stay washed up without water. Yeah. So uh, at our church, we partner with uh, others in our community to help distribute food. Uh, we help to distribute diapers, which believe it or not are an issue, not just for infants, but for adults. Uh, we partner to make, well, we were until COVID came, we partner to make our church a community center. We're looking at now uh, extending our Wi-Fi out into the parking lot. So people who are, distant but don't have access to the internet can get in so those are the kind of things that we're doing mm, those are some great responses pastor scott mckee what's uh what what do you say who is jesus calling us to spend most of our time focusing on or who is ward focusing on and what does that look like for your church you know that first couple of weeks things seem to change by the hour and the the definition of vulnerable seem to shift still to this day so we initially we we jumped to the idea that it was older people who were vulnerable right. and those who were isolated. And we started just phone calling. We had a phone calling campaign to call everyone in our church yeah. over 70 to check. And then it shifted. And then we really jumped on the, the, the medical care uh, folks. And uh, our congregation has been mobilized to sew uh, masks when that was what's needed. Maybe that's going to dissipate. But right now we have, we have, uh, we have hand sewn uh, more than a thousand masks and delivered them to two different hospitals and nursing home facilities when that was the need. And, and it's really, really great to see um, our people who know how to sew, but then we have young people watching YouTube videos to figure mm -hmm. out how to sew so they can be a part of it. We got one guy, you know, just, just, just learned that and ordered something on Amazon and his masks, they're not attractive, but they will, they will be helpful <laughs> to somebody. Uh, and, you know, the, the needs seem to be shifting, and, and uh, we're trying to keep up with that. That's probably a good idea to have the, mo the, the least attractive mask you can have because you <laughs> want to keep people at a distance, right? No problem so, there, yeah. The, the, the guy sounds brilliant. So, Pastor Chris Brooks, what does Woodside say, and, and what are you guys up to? Yeah, I mean, such a tough question. I think in many ways there's so many to serve. And I think that we all have to contextualize ministry. My answer may be different than my brother's. And I commend um, all the pastors that are doing such a phenomenal job as I see the church stepping up. But we uh, felt called deeply to the people of Pontiac. Uh, we're in Pontiac as a, as a church. Our campus is there. Our dream centers are there. So we partnered up with Chick-fil-A uh, and have been uh, providing grab-and-go uh, lunches uh, for uh, families there and grateful for that partnership and like Scott uh, trying to support our medical uh, professionals 
Uh, we also have started uh, what we call uh, Takeout Tuesday, uh, where we are ordering uh, lunch for uh, medical professionals uh, uh, at our hospitals from local restaurants. So that way we can support the small business owners because this is a really tough time for small business owners. And we know the economy is about 60% small business owners. So if that was a, a double win. It was an ability for us to provide food for doctors, nurses, um, uh, those who are doing janitorial work at our hospitals, uh, keeping them clean that are working so hard, Chris, that you know most of them don't have time to grab water or let alone make lunch. So we're doing that on Tuesdays. But I would say that uh, all of those things are great. As a dad, probably the greatest group that's on my heart right now are those that are under my roof, uh, my wife and my kids. Mm -hmm. And I never want to be guilty of being a public success and a private failure. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get this opportunity again to focus on my kids um, and my wife without the distractions of movies and malls and all of those other things. The quarantining at home has been phenomenal. Difficult uh, at times, but phenomenal from a discipleship perspective. And two of my kids uh, gave their life to Christ this weekend. So it's been like a really, really awesome time of being able to share the gospel with my kids. So I would imagine that while Christ wants us to reach our community and our neighbors, he would not want us to overlook our family either. Mm, yeah, excellent. <laughs> It's been hard to know how to be helpful because you, you, we, there is something impulse for Christ followers to rush in and do something. We yeah. want to rush in yes. like, like folks did during plagues and hold the hands of the dying. And we did, yeah. we mobilized volunteers to deliver meals to, uh, to, you know, school kids who rely on the public programs and we're doing groceries. But after a while, you know, we're asking our volunteers to put yes. themselves in harm's <laughs> way, which they are happy to do for the cause of Jesus as generations have gone before us. It's it better to, to, for us to die and be in Christ. Uh, but, but then we also know we're putting our families at risk and putting people at risk. So this one, this one's been a tricky way to That's know right. how to mobilize, how to mobilize the church for action so that we're not doing more harm than good. Well, we all know we're in a time of great uncertainty and that means we probably all have made a lot of mistakes. We're probably going to make more mistakes. Uh, these days, if any church is featured in national media, we can pretty much guarantee the story is going to be embarrassing. <laughs> and yes. other than the recent national news stories that, that we've seen of some of the crazy things that, that have happened with pastors making maybe some mistakes during COVID-19, what are some mistakes that, that you've seen uh, pastors make as it relates to this pandemic? Uh, let's start with Reverend Larry. I, I probably... Um most of the pastors with whom I have interacted have really uh, stepped up. So I, I think I'll use myself as the biggest mistake. Uh, sure. The very first week we were in social isolation, we did not hold service because I couldn't figure out how to make it happen. Uh, in retrospect, uh, we did, as it turned out, have the capacity to do it, but we were so busy caught up in the constantly shifting, changing parameters about what to do and who could meet and uh, where to go, um, we didn't think through what we did. So we had our prayer groups to meet, but we didn't hold service. I think that was a big mistake. And I, one I would, I guarantee you would never do again. But I think that's the biggest mistake that I've made. And um, do you mean that you didn't have an online service? Is that what you're talking right, about? Right, correct. Correct. Um, and so I would, I would do differently. That's, I, I think uh, we should always have worship. And uh, we are actually setting up in the event that we can't get online, we're setting up to have cell group worships. So people can call using their cell phone and using connected um, um, what's the um, voice uh I'm grabbing my phone so I can remember what this like is. Like a conference call. <laughs> conference call, thank you. So using connected conference calls. So I call you, you call somebody else, they call somebody else. And so you can chain link a conference call together. Those are things which we now know. And so we're setting up in the event that all of these Zoom go to meetings collapse, we can try and worship using those methods. Okay, that's, that's uh, innovation. I like it. Pastor Chris Brooks, what do you say? 
Yeah, like Larry, I'm not down on pastors. I think that most are trying to do the best they can. And as Scott said, this has been so dynamic and shifting so much. Uh, so again, I'll use my myself as an example. I think that uh, I heard a doctor say once that on the front end of a pandemic, um, everything we do seems like too much. On the back mm. end of a pandemic, nothing we did seemed like it was enough. Mm. Um, I wish I would have responded quicker, uh, more thoroughly, um, and um, you know, trying to uh, play catch up in every sense of the word. Um, so uh, I guess that would be my general answer to that. I would also say that if I do have any encouragement for my um, pastor colleagues and friends, it's just don't uh, make the mistake of isolation. Uh, let's connect. Let's make sure we're talking to one another through this. Yeah. Now is not the time for tribalism, uh, silos, trying to figure it out as a long ranger. Even the long ranger had Tonto. <laughs> and so uh, I got I got that from Scott. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, I, I think that if we do make a mistake, it, it probably would be, we're so used to kind of operating in isolation and uh, yes, hopefully please. this can be a season of great collaboration. All right, Scott, looks like Chris already took all your best material, but uh, you got to- <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I think the danger for all of us, yeah, we're all figuring this out, but, you know, it's a danger to think too much of this or to think too little of this. The churches that are just going business as usual and those churches that have been on TV still meeting, like th- this is not business yeah. as usual. This is a big deal. Yeah, on the other right. side of the spectrum are people that this is Armageddon and this is the end of the world. And uh, we can look back at history and say, you know, every generation gets one of these on their watch and this is ours. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a mistake to make too much or, or too little, but it, it is a, that, that, that the sense of that has seemed to change from day to day. Well, I wasn't you know was going to ask you guys for your thoughts on the book of Revelation as it relates to this t- period of time. But <laughs> there's a whole lot of thoughts going around r- right now That's, on that book. I can tell I you that. I was just about to say that. I, um, I do not count myself an expert on the book of Revelation. And if you know somebody who is, please text me their number because I need to make a call. Uh, but I think probably there is a mistake. It is trying to too literally map current events to the book of Revelation. Uh, The one thing, whenever I teach uh, uh, the eschatology, the the book of Revelation or end times conversations, I always begin with Jesus's words. Nobody knows when the end time is coming, but God. And so spending a lot of time trying to, you know, count if somebody's name adds up to 666, uh, is is not not only is it not helpful, it's not biblical. So I think if there's a mistake, I think I've heard. I don't know if these are pastors either. I have heard a couple of people try to map Revelation too tightly uh, to events. Yeah, I think um, you know there's a human temptation to to have answers during this yes. time and and to be the person, the man or the woman that that's got it all figured out and. Uh, Revelation is one of those books that opens itself up maybe to a whole lot of different interpretations. So let's, let's shift to, you know, the bright side of life. Let's talk about what's one of the most inspirational things that uh, you have seen or heard during this experience of this pandemic. So we'll start with you, uh, Pastor Scott. Well, you know, I, I love the way people are making heroes of our medical community as we ought to. But I'm really tickled by the way that we're making heroes of grocery store clerks. Yes. Okay. The way people are saying thank you to the people who work at Myers, because um, I, I don't think you know they're used to being made heroes of, and it's wonderful to see that appreciation flow that way. I gave a challenge to our church uh, that you know stay home, honor the stay-at-home order, but when you have to go out to get your groceries and you're in line, get one of those gift cards that are waiting there at the checkout line and and give it to the cashier and ask the cashier to put whatever amount you feel God tells you to put on that. And when the cashier gives it back, you turn around and give it back to the cashier and say, this is for you. Thank you for working. God bless you. And that's it. And, uh, and I've I've been getting emails from people that have been doing that and the shocked reaction of cashiers. And um, it's a real opportunity, you know, to, I mean, for, to say God bless you or may the peace of the Lord be with you, that, that yes. might have been weird three weeks ago. It is not weird today. 
and we're seeing all kinds of opportunities. So I love the new, the, the heroes that are being made in this, in this era. I love that. All right, Pastor Chris, what you got? Yeah, so uh, much has been made about toilet paper in this season, you know, and uh, so it's a valuable commodity. And so one of uh, <clears throat> our friends um, <clears throat> was able to creatively put together kind of a wrap in a bow, uh, a roll of paper towel and toilet paper with a bouquet of flowers stuffed in, in the top of the uh, top of the uh, toilet, uh, the paper towel and went to uh, about 50 different neighbors houses and dropped it off with a, with a little note there saying hey I uh, just want you to know we love you we're praying for you here's my email address if there's any way that my family can be praying for you we will be and I just thought that was just one of those powerful simple acts of kindness uh, sometimes we think that it takes, you know, this huge or massive program, but really it, it boils down to thoughtfulness. So I got my little bouquet uh, sitting on my uh, counter in my kitchen uh, of uh, paper towel and toilet paper. And if push comes to shove, I'll be okay. <laughs> That's good to know. All right. <laughs> good to know. Reverend Larry, what, what's something oh. inspirational you've seen or heard? How do I follow that? No, there's no, there's no way. <laughs> that could okay. be the most inspirational Actually, thing you've heard, or, or you got something in mind? I'm going to pick on a mutual friend that Chris and I have. Um, we suffered together a loss of someone, but uh, in our group, uh, one of our friends uh, tagged us the God guys, and. Um, I think the most inspirational thing that I've seen was a prayer written by this member of the group in behalf of the man who was sick. That moved me more than I can tell you because this person had expressed such doubts and uncertainty and um, I wouldn't say faithlessness because I don't think he was ever there, but um, unsure. He was very, very, very unsure. But in this moment, that that seed that was in him sprouted. And he and he wrote one of the most powerful and beautiful prayers I think I've ever seen. That was inspirational. You know, the, the guy you're talking about, I'm not going to say his name. He's one of my best friends. And uh, he would <laughs> say this, but I'm going to let him tell his story in public when he's ready. But um, up until about a year ago, he didn't believe God existed. Then I've been working with him a lot as he's just as a friend and sharing my faith with him. He then started to believe in the universe. So he's been talking a whole lot about the universe. And now he's talking to God and directly yes. to God. And yeah. that prayer that you talked about, I, I would put that right up there at the top of my list as well. What God is doing in him uh, is pretty profound. So, um, all right, what do you guys say to Christians? who don't take social distancing seriously because they are protected by God. I heard someone say the other day that they were washed in the blood of Jesus so they can take basically whatever risks they need to take uh, during COVID-19. What, what do you say, Reverend Larry? <laughs> They're protected from the second death, but they've given a sound mind to protect them from COVID-19. <laughs> it is, it is, uh, an abuse of scripture. And uh, the reason, and, and let me let me take Jesus in the wilderness for one quick example. Uh, the way the devil tempted Jesus was to present him with acts that required him to test God. And Jesus responded to him again and again with the word of God, that God doesn't need to be tested that you trust God on faith. I don't have to jump off of this to prove that I'm the son of God. Uh, so testing God by disregarding your leaders, I won't go into you know, Romans 13 that tells us to be submissive to our leadership. There's scripture all over that would argue that we follow the rules that are given to us for our well-being uh, and that this misapplication of the word is why we require Bible study. Okay. Y'all who are listed on Facebook, find a good Bible teaching pastor and go to Bible study. I like it. Um, pastor Chris, what do you think? You know, I, you know, I think that everyone, again, is sincerely trying to live out their faith before 
uh, Jesus. And so um, I'm not critical. It's easy to kind of take target practice at times. Um, I, I would say this, uh, two things drive me. Number one, uh, the question of what does it mean to uh, love my neighbor? Uh, and so even if I am persuaded that I am safe and protected, um, I don't want to put my neighbor neighbor at risk of anything, uh, the people that I love. And so that would be one thing that compels me. The other is Paul's um, challenge to the Corinthians. If me defend my brother, I won't eat meat. Um, if uh, going and out puts uh, my brothers or sisters at risk, then, you know, I, I won't go out. Um, but it's driven by, Chris, not uh, a sense of fear or self-preservation. I don't think we can be motivated by those things. I think that ultimately it's love of God and love of neighbor that mm -hmm. should drive our decisions. And so I would really challenge that person to say, what's the motivation uh, for your perspective and stance? Is it driven by love of neighbor? Is it driven by your understanding of the scriptures on how you can best serve and love your neighbor on Christ's behalf? Or is it driven by some sense of triumphalism or trying to prove uh, uh, the strength of your own faith? Right now is not a time for us to try to show off. Uh, faith is not given uh, for entertainment purposes. It's not given for self accolade. Faith is given for service to others. Yes. And so hopefully that's what's motivating uh, the way that we live. Scott, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, Martin Luther, the great 16th century Protestant reformer, you know, in his day, they faced the bubonic plague and churches fight, fought about the right way to approach that. Uh, uh, the debate was whether Christians could leave town or not, because some thought Christians need to stay and serve, as we talked about the great history of Christians of serving the sick and the dying and other people, other Christians wanted to flee. And so Martin Luther wrote a paper on this, as he often did. It was titled, Whether or Not to Flee a Deadly Plague. Just, uh, just a, uh, a really catchy title uh, and for his day. And he unusually, uh, he, he had a middle ground, which very rare for him. Um, he, he chose to stay and, and work, but he, he, he urged people who were ill to self-quarantine. That was a very unusual idea in the medieval age. He encouraged hospitals. He was pro-medicine because his day, some Christians said we shouldn't take medicine because we're Christians. Martin Luther said, you should take, take medicine. Um, he, he, he said that if people uh, were ill and they knew it and they exposed other people to it, he called them murderers. Um, and he was pretty, pretty harsh. Um, and, and even in that, for him and other Christians who chose to stay and serve the sick and dying, they didn't do so believing that their lives would be preserved. Mm. I mean, they did so believing this could be their end, that they would follow Christ even if it meant their death. Um, I, I think God did, God, we do serve a miracle working God, but but yeah. God makes no guarantees for that. We serve him in life and in death. That's right. And, uh, and you really, really have to, as Chris said, I think people are trying to figure out how your faith applies. Um, but there's cautions on, on all sides. All right. Let's talk about <sighs> grieving for a little bit. Uh, Chris, you brought it up earlier. Um, you know, Larry and I both lost uh, a mutual friend, Marlo Stoudemire. Uh, I've now lost four people that I knew personally. Two of them. One of them was in the church I used to pastor. Uh, two of them I knew fairly well. And um, so the grieving process has been totally changed, right? Just like so many other things. Um, you talked about, Chris, that family members aren't able to see a person in ICU who has COVID-19. In Marlo's case, uh, it's quite possible that no one who ever knew Marlo will ever see his body again this side of eternity. His body may be cremated, uh, no open casket. You're not allowed to have a funeral with a large number of people. You can't have a wake with a meal afterwards. So what guidance do you recommend or are you giving to people who are grieving a loved one? I mean, there's all types of grieving that we're all going through. We're grieving loss of jobs. We're grieving change. We're, we're, we're grieving the economy. But let's just talk right now about, you know, our greatest grief, losing people we love. Uh, Pastor Scott, let's start with you. What what would you say in this new normal? Yeah. How do people grieve? Yeah, all the things we normally, you know, I used to tell people, trust the yeah. process. There's a reason there's a funeral. There's a reason people eat potato salad afterwards. I don't know why, but the these processes are designed to be healing and the process has been torn away from us. And this is a day, I mean, I, I feel funny saying this, but this is a day 
where we'll seek our comfort in Christ alone. And I think of David, when he had a really hard day and he got back and his wife and kids had been taken and the city was trashed and his men wanted to kill him. And there's this line I've never fully understood. David strengthened himself in the Lord. I'm not even, I'm not even fully sure what that, what that means, but we live in a day where we're going to have to learn what that means because that's all that we, all the option we're going to have for some of us. We have to learn what it means to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and to seek the kind of comfort that, that God provides. Pastor Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, much of uh, my thoughts are in agreement with my brother Scott. I think that we need to, in this moment, remember he is the God of all comforts. He tells us that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Uh, I'm advising people to, um, again, like everyone else, connect as much as they can where they can. So uh, it, it, thank God for technology. I don't know how we would navigate through moments like this in previous generations, but uh, as, as Pastor Larry has said, we have Zoom, we have GoToMeeting, we have other ways of connecting. And so being able to take advantage of that, but remembering the truth that one of the titles ascribed to Christ is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And so um, we have to take comfort in the fact that that we are alone, but never alone, and um, and that he, he's with us. And so most of what I've tried to do is just practice presence ministry over the phone, crying with people, grieving with people, and uh, trying my best to be there and give those virtual hugs as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Reverend Larry, um, you know, one of the things you and I got to do with the loss of Marlo is, is have some time on Zoom with a few of our yeah. buddies and just tell stories uh, yeah. about Marlo. That that was really powerful um, and very needed in all yeah. of our lives. But what what are your thoughts? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with with my brothers here. I think that ministry of presence. Uh, I had a, a fellow minister in the Amy Church teach me this years ago. I remember uh, speaking to her about being in a really tragic situation and not knowing what to say. And she said, you know, there's a ministry in being present. Practice the ministry of presence. And um, they've covered it so well. I wanna, I wanna come at this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I, I deeply believe that God um, sends us into the place and the space because he has equipped us particularly for that time. And I believe that we're particularly gifted for this moment. And, and um, for those members of the church uh, who are growing from, from babies to adults, uh, as the scripture teaches us, we all will do. It is a time for us to minister to the grace and the eternal promise of Christ. Come 2030, it's unlikely any of us are gonna be here. So all of us are going to meet death. And so as much as we hurt and we grieve over what we are not experiencing, it is our faith in Christ that assures us that we weep not like those who have no hope. And so I would, I would ask those members of the body of faith that this is the moment in which we grow we say and declare and walk in the full and certain promise that Christ is going to take care of us. Even when this body, earthly body decays, Christ is going to take care of us. So that would be the, the one thing I would, everything they've said, I agree with. That would be the one thing I would add. Well, I want to add that I do plan on being here in 2030. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mary. <laughs> So, yeah, I, want to put a, I want to put a plug in for the old school technology 30, right now. 30-30. Okay. Oh, 30-30 is a little short. I'm over to be here 20-30. Pick that 30-30. All right. I feel much better. Okay. I, I, want to put a, I want to put a plug in for the old school technology of the telephone. The telephone yes. really works right now. There's no school yes. like the old school. And uh, it can really work. And I know, you know our older staff are having to learn Zoom. And our younger staff are having to use the telephone, learn how to use a telephone. Like, you know, this thing, you can talk to people on this. You can, you, you put it, 
<laughs> you can talk to people. And uh, I think I think we've forgotten that. Man, this is a great time to bring back the telephone. We can all do that. And some of that comfort, some of that connection can come. And you don't need to be a, a great tech person to offer it. Okay. It's uh, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, coming up this weekend. For the first time in the history of your churches, you are not gathering physically. All right. I want to ask you to do something extremely difficult. This is not the time for a, a vignette of your Sunday service, but can you tell us in 30 seconds or less, what is the message of hope that you want people to hear? Pastor Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, Christ is triumphant uh, in, in all things. Our Heaven is not panicked, uh, that his promises are still uh, true, and that though the building is closed, the mission never ends. Oh my gosh, you did that in like under 10 seconds. That That was... <laughs> That's put some real pressure on you, uh, Pastor. That's Scott. what happens when you go from the city to the suburbs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pastor Scott, what, what's your message of hope that uh, that God's given you to share with others? Yep, the church building is empty, and so is the grave. That's the news we celebrate, and God is the God of the third day. You know, there's the first day is dark, the second day is a day of waiting, the third day is a day of resurrection, and for a lot of people right now, it feels like we're in day two. But the third day is coming. God is the God of the third day. Wow, I should have told you guys to do this in 10 seconds or less. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely really over-delivering here. Okay, Reverend Larry, you, you may get 31 seconds because they, they bought you some time. <laughs> 10 years ago, well, a little over, in 2009, our church burned nearly to the ground. Um, when I came into the sanctuary, uh, the building was smoldering. And there had been a cross on the wall at the back end of the church. It was gone, but there on the wall, burned into the wall, was an image of the cross. And that night, it looked like it was hopeless that that building was gone. But God arrived and blessed us. And this small congregation was to, able to rebuild this building in the midst of one of the poorest communities in America to serve as a reminder that God does not abandon those who are in trouble. And so I, my message is, will be that God has not abandoned us. If we will just have faith and stay with it, it may take a while for us to get there, but God is going to bring us through just like he brought the Jews to the promised land. He's going to bring us through COVID-19. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we've had a number of questions come in. You guys have actually answered almost all of them just through your statements. Um, somebody did ask about what are the recommendations you have for safely distributing food? Uh, you know, Pastor Chris, you guys have been doing a lot of that. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you. So, yeah, I think I think real quickly, make sure you're not a long ranger. As Scott said, there's a natural desire just to kind of run in, work through agency, work through the church some community organization that's following CDC guidelines, no person to person contact. When we have distributed boxes of food, we've tried to put it directly into people's trunks. Or if there is uh, again, grab and go boxes where people can individually grab their box and keep moving. And it doesn't have to be the person to person contact right now. Um, I got a question from a, a firefighter who I know personally, Teresa Singleton, she's a good friend. She lives five houses away from the Dirt Innovation Society. She runs Boutique, which is a retail store in our building. She's a first responder. And uh, she's commented she's seeing a lot of things that she really wishes her eyes could unsee. Uh, what advice do you have to give to her? Anybody can jump in on that. And this is hard for a 30 second response. Uh, my first answer would be that she should when she can, walk next door. Or if she's that close to you, sit out on the porch and allow you to minister to her. There are some things for which only faith can bring us through. There are things which we cannot unsee. And so uh, I have an image of my mother because I had to identify her body when she passed. That image is seared into my mind. It is only my faith in Christ that helps me get through the grief of having to carry that image uh, the rest of my life. 
You need a pastor who will help you uh, navigate this moment with whom you can share your pain and who can help you show, help show you how Christ can deliver you from, as he has hey, delivered me. Hey, Chris, I just want to also, in addition to what Pastor Larry said, give a shout out to the unsung heroes in the mental health community. Yes. Uh, we need to praise God for them. As you know, uh, the image of uh, my son, uh, we um, went through the loss of our son last year and the image of, uh, of that uh, going to the place where his body was found. Um, those are really painful things. And uh, last week on my radio program, I had Dr. Serena Black on, who I appreciate greatly, a lifelong Detroiter who's doing a great uh, job counseling uh, those who are hurting. Um, with my counselor, my wife and I have a grief counselor. We've been able to maintain our rhythms of meeting with our grief counselor uh, through technology, uh, FaceTime, Zoom. And so counselors are still meeting, uh, still possible to get in contact with them. Mm -hmm. So in addition to a pastor, I would say find a good godly counselor. Yes. I want to say godly. into that because I have a lot of friends who have been in environments, spiritual environments where they were actually discouraged from mm -hmm. any kind of mental health professional guidance. So I, I really appreciate you adding that into the mix. Pastor Scott, anything you want to add? That's why yeah, I said yeah. it to you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, don't need, we don't need to shy back uh, from, from counselors and therapists. Uh, the Bible talks right. about the renewing of the mind, the renewing of the mind. That's part, that's part of it. God renews the mind, but yeah. wise, wise uh, a third party person can help us through that. And uh, I don't know, how, uh, other generations have had to do the same thing. I, I, I'd like to just thank that question writer for, for their personal sacrifice. Yes. And the, the toll it's taken on their body and their minds for the sake of others. Uh, thank you. Let me, let me just add this to Chris, because we, we are in the ministry. We take this, we take this for granted like our members do. Uh, I don't know how this shows on camera, but I'm wearing a shirt that says Second uh, Chronicles 714. And prayer really makes a difference. And so uh, I still would direct her to see you, not just as your friend and neighbor, but as a leader, as a pastor in Christ, and to seek you out, but also to pray, um, just to talk to God about what you are feeling and to ask God to help relieve you of the pain of what you've experienced. Prayer makes things change. I believe that. And let's end on that note. I, I believe prayer does more than just psychologically help the person yes. pray. I, I literally believe that God intervenes. And I know everyone on this call does too. So Pastor Chris Brooks, can I ask you to, to just close us all in a word of prayer? Yeah, I'd be honored to. Father God, we come to you, our rock, uh, the one who is able to keep us through all things. We acknowledge your goodness. You are faithful. Uh, we thank you, the Lord, that you are Emmanuel, God with us even in uh, this difficult moment. Uh, may uh, the light of Christ shine brightly through your saints yeah. in this moment, through the people of God. May we love our families and our neighbors well. May we sense your comfort near. Uh, the Lord, may you, the Lord, uh, comfort the grieving and those who are serving the Lord on the front lines of this current crisis. Give our leaders uh, wisdom, we do pray. And Lord, I pray uh, that as pastors, we would shepherd uh, well, knowing the Lord that you are the good shepherd in all things. Yes, you Thank you for this time we've been able to spend together. May hearts be uh, encouraged, the Lord. And this week, we celebrate those uh, awesome words that he is risen. He is risen yes. indeed. Thank God that the tomb is empty, that you are alive, and that our hope is in you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, first, brothers, you guys are doing such great work. My uh, my little puppy wants got to a visitor. Wow. Yeah, got a little a puppy. Visitor. He says hey, man, he actually weighs uh, five pounds more than I do. But hey, I love you guys. The dog had to kneel down to take that shot. <laughs> I would like to ask everybody to be praying for these pastors, your pastor, all the pastors in our region. Uh, these are men on the front, men and women on the front lines, and they need our prayers, our love, our support. God bless you guys. Bless you.